Meet the first time smugglers, I said way back in episode number one. Former car salesman Jed Pontiac from Cleveland, Ohio, set out for South America and eventually returned to the USA wearing a fat suit with almost five kilos of cocaine. He wouldn't have made it at all were it not for the streetwise girlfriend Myra Pink who sold her pre-stolen watch to fund the run. Across the Atlantic Ocean, Cambridge Englishman Kevin Block took a different path. After a lot of waiting in Colombia and Peru, he found himself confined to a COVID quarantine hotel in London until his new Spanish connection sent a so-called chemist to extract his Charlie from a couple of hard-shelled suitcases. Did either Jed or Kevin make a fortune? No. Did they make any money? Very little. So what did they get for putting their freedom on the line? Like all of us in life, they learned from experience. Were they cured of risk-taking and coke-sniffing? Not for a minute. Hello, David McMillan here, sifting through the letters, phone calls, hotel records, credit card charges and pleas from many of those involved, all of which give a story of our intrepid friends' moves. Episode 8 gives a quick run-through of their history as no, well, just beginners in the trade, and you'll find the entire series now has a new name. Recovering from Failure. Kevin, UK, and Jed, USA, learn how to smuggle cocaine across borders, parts 1 to 9. And hang around, or at least fast forward to the end, and win a prize for knowing something. So, the future was looking bleak for Kevin. He had his two vaccination shots and somehow kept his girlfriend Carrie Colonic despite an awful staycation in a caravan on the windswept southern English coast. Carrie's half-witted brother is, for now, out of the picture. Brother Bradley hoped to impress his new policeman pals by becoming an informer. That didn't work out. The information about drugs arriving at a Spanish airport turned out to be useless. And in any case, Bradley's uniformed pals were not the serious organized crime agency, as known as soccer, a kind of British FBI, but tactical response group trainees who'd all been sent back to their regional desks after posing for one photograph in full SWAT team kit. A worn, frayed and fading picture that each keeps folded in his wallet. As for Jed, he's been run around in circles. He's confused. You see, without Myra, he can't tell who's real and who is not. He has $11,500 left from his dealings with K, the Greenwich Village, or was it Fire Island, contact that has become nothing more than an occasional voice on the phone. His choice is to go back to Centerville and selling cars or take some vague promise about a new thing in Costa Rica, Central America. He does neither, but heads southwest. Jed takes a train to Baltimore, where he picks up a 2019 Chevy Colorado in metallic grey, I'm told, from a used car contact he has. He drops the rear seat panels and loads them with blankets so he won't have to pick up any hitchhikers as he takes Route 70 to Hagerstown in Maryland, where his 
Widowed Dad still has the old family house. When Jed was a kid, he dreamt of moving a little way south to Funkstown, but soon found there was no funk in Funkstown. There were no hitchhikers on this road trip 20 years later, and uh, a week watching Dad stare from the living room window only reminded Jed why he left. Kevin in England has been trying to find out what is important in his life too. He knows he's missed the tech wave. There's no startups on the horizon post-COVID, but he thinks he's been playing in the wrong field, South America, and with the wrong drug, cocaine. Kevin turns down the dial in his mind and the potential sentences if he gets caught. He's got a plan for some quality hashish. No, not the Moroccan soap bars that uh, half ground up apricot kernel, but some Lebanese gold. Besides, Morocco would mean the Spanish, and his Spanish bridges have been reduced to ashes. We go where our contacts allow. We do what we can. Besides, some misdirected mashup of ethics tells Kevin he's better off away from the coke and honest marijuana derivatives are, if not legal, at least something one can admit to trading in amongst friends. But how to get to Beirut? And what will timid curry make of that? Uh, she won't want to travel, that's for sure. On the other hand, Kerry did take a bit of a shine five years ago when Kevin's Lebanese friend Alex visited London. And Alex's family was in the wine business, everyone was told. Should Kevin tell Kerry the truth? I don't have to tell you what my advice would be. But it is now too late. I have a postcard from Kevin on my desk. It was sent from Larnaca in Cyprus. A nice picture of some sunny stones. And even that was a lie. To avoid quarantine in Cyprus, Kevin and Carrie mixed themselves into a flight through Germany and Turkey to get to the Turkish-controlled northern Cyprus. Alex had arranged for them to be take it across over to Greek Cyprus, so they could in turn take the ferry over to Lebanon. A needless complication in my mind, but I've done needless complications before. What does that postcard say in Kevin's scratchy handwriting? Carrie can't wait to get to the Bekar Valley and sample the famous Chateau Moussa. And Kevin is looking forward to samples of his own. In another part of the world, Jed Pontiac has woken up in a tangle of white bedsheets in room 33 of Hotel La Sueva, Limon, having flown into San Jose two days earlier. The quiet town is on the Pacific coast of Costa Rica, and Costa Rica is a fine place to be. It is one of the very few countries in the world without a standing army, a fact that was uh, once seen as an insult to the United States. Native Costa Ricans call themselves ticos and ticas. A good time will cost 50,000 colon, but that is still less than $100. Part of the shoreline looks like a whale's tail but it may be into the lion's jaw that Jed may find himself in the next few days as he takes Highway 36 through Bribi, Olivia, Margarita, Sixola and the Panama border crossing. And quite a poem and quite a journey. The bedsheets were tangled with the aid of Carmelita Van Buren the previous night and Jed would be similarly tangled in guilt 
for the nighttime betrayal, in his mind, of his Myra Pink. Of course, that infidelity is assuaged by the possibility that Carmelita is leading Jed into a trap in Panama. Jed took a call from the elusive K, who told him to look in the letterbox of his dad's Maryland house. Inside, a thick envelope contained a set of documents wrapped around a new cell phone and held by a rubber band. Those all dropped to the dusty ground as Jed spun around, looking left and right. The thing was this, the envelope had no stamp on it. Someone must have hand-delivered the small package to the curbside letterbox. How did Kay know his dad's address? Was he followed? Does that amount of care mean he is in the hands of a thoughtful Dr. Evil? who will bring underground fame and success to the Pontiac stable, or ruin and imprisonment south of the border. The cell phone had email responses from an airline with QR codes for check-in at Atlanta the night after the following day on Spirit Airlines. Time to hit the road. Jeff left a note for the woman who visited to look after Dad. Carmelita and her driver met Jed at San Jose Airport upon arrival. In the hours driving to Limon, he was told of his itinerary. Part of the trip was to collect a bag containing three kilos of coke, but the real meat and potatoes was a meeting in Colón, Panama. Colón is a free trade zone where international freight carriers park up their containers while perhaps changing ships for onward journeys. Well, that is how it's described in the literature. It has services and banks. It is not strictly part of Panama, yet under Panamanian control. It has privacy and security and all the things serious people want. Jed has a meeting at the delicious restaurant, Avenue 1A. He wants to call Myra in Amsterdam. He feels swamped in the sunshine. He is lost without her. In another part of the world, a city of two and a half million people is in darkness. No, it is not wartime. But this capital is not under attack by planes and bombs. It is under attack by rampant and unashamed corruption by the country's officials. This is Beirut, Lebanon, once called the Paris of the East. An inherited disunity within the structure of government means that power-generating stations are attempting to run the electricity-generating machines on substandard fuel. English Kevin and his girl Carrie have left their hotel to drive to Cafreya in the wine district. There, as dawn breaks, they are greeted by Alex, their old friend, who takes them to a villa nestled in the hills. They settle into a guest room as breakfast is prepared by the family of their host. Carrie chooses to believe that Kevin may be going into the wine business. It is best that way. Kevin believes they will spend an enjoyable couple of weeks in the countryside before making arrangements with Alex for some carved cedar kitchen tables to be sent via two points in Europe, Cyprus and Belgium, and on to England. The tables are to be packed with the famed Lebanese gold hashish. So far, we do not know what Alex believes. It is good to have a plan. The sun shines upon the earth. It is a little warmer than usual. In Limon, Costa Rica, Jed has finished a light lunch by the hotel pool. He sees Carmelita arrive and smiles. 
in Lebanon after breakfast as Kevin is enjoying a cigarette by himself on the villa's empty patio, Alex finally arrives. He speaks to Kevin at the same moment that Carmelita kneels by reclining Jed and leans forward. At 11,999 kilometers apart, both Costa Rican Carmelita and Lebanese Alex, complete strangers to each other, speak the same words in the same language. There has been a change of plan. Now, that's something you don't expect to hear. Or is it? I wonder how often people in the world of English speakers say the same thing at the same time. Is this very unlikely or not so unlikely, and why? Does it happen more in criminal enterprises or more in regular life? Let me know your thoughts. The best answer wins a free book. What is Jed going to find when he takes his meeting in Cologne? Will Kevin find success in the hash business? Or will the returns on Puff be so low that he returns to sniff? Join me for episode 10 of The Adventures of Kevin and Jed, coming soon or living it now. Anyone think this will make a Christmas book? A little snow for December? Off to bed now, chillin'. Good night.